Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn Dwyer and this show is Castle Kevin, Life and Death on a Medieval Frontier. Today, the long forgotten ruins of the medieval fortress and town of Castle Kevin stand in a remote valley in the Wicklow Mountains. Situated east of the picturesque village of Anamo, there is little evidence in what is now an overgrown mound of earth of Castle Kevin's turbulent past. While local history understandably focuses on the nearby famous monastery of Glendalough, the sleepy valley where Castle Kevin stands today has its own remarkable past. Although it has seen little activity in about two centuries, it has its own hair-raising medieval history. In the early 14th century, it became the epicentre of one of the most ferocious conflicts of the age, when the Gaelic-Irish fought Anglo-Norman colonists for control of the Wicklow Mountains. This story we are about to hear is nothing short of a bitter and brutal struggle for survival on a medieval frontier. The story of Castle Kevin originates where so many histories from medieval Ireland begin. On long sandy beaches in County Wexford in the summer of 1169. It was here that hundreds of Norman mercenaries waded ashore beginning what would become the Norman conquest of Ireland. In the following decades of the late 12th century, these men went on to conquer large tracts of Ireland. Initially, the region around Castle Kevin in the Wicklow Mountains was protected from the violence and chaos of the invasion. This was due to the fact that Castle Kevin, which at this stage was only a forested valley, was part of the lands of the nearby monastery of Glendalough which was the centre of a large diocese of the same name. Even though the Normans did not dare conquer church lands such as Glendalough and the nearby Castle Kevin, this situation was not to last. After their invasion of Ireland, the Normans sought to control the church by appointing members of their own families to key positions. Now this had been easy in places like Dublin where the Normans had total control. So much so that after 1181, all the bishops of Dublin were Anglo-Normans. In Glendalough, however, there was a different situation. The Gaelic Irish dominated the region and thereby dominated the church. Now, This situation attracted the eye of Norman authorities in Dublin as a potential problem. However, an invasion was completely out of the question. But where the sword failed, the pen succeeded. The Normans lobbied the Pope to amalgamate the dioceses of Dublin and Glendalough into one under the authority of the Anglo-Norman bishops of Dublin. With the stroke of a pen, tens of thousands of acres passed into the hands of the then Archbishop of Dublin, Henry of London. These lands included Glendalough itself, Glenmalure where the O'Toole's had settled, and most importantly for our story, Castle Kevin. In 1216, when the amalgamation finally went ahead, Glendalough and its lands, including Castle Kevin, were now under the control of a man called Henry of London, the Archbishop of Dublin. Henry was now one of the biggest landowners in Ireland, and he soon set about getting the most from his lands. This saw the world of East Wicklow begin to change rapidly as Henry cleared forests to make way for farmland. The once heavily forested foothills of the Wicklow Mountains, including Castle Kevin, were cleared of trees and new farms and fields dominated this landscape. This new environment was populated with Anglo-Norman settlers, utterly transforming what had once been the lands of the Gaelic bishops of Glendalough. Despite the huge changes brought about by the clearing of the land and the arrival of settlers, tensions between the Gaelic Irish and the Normans who had dispossessed them appeared to have been very low in the entire Wicklow area. There was one incident, however, which served to remind everyone that while the Gaelic Irish were not rebelling, there were major underlying tensions still remaining, which had been caused by the conquest. On Easter Monday, 1209, the Anglo-Norman citizens of Dublin 
had been enjoying festivities at Collinswood, which is situated in the modern suburb of Branla, about two kilometres from the medieval city walls. Out of the blue, the Gaelic Irish from the nearby Wicklow Mountains stormed down and slaughtered hundreds of the Anglo-Norman Dubliners. Indeed, it was claimed that so many were killed that new settlers had to come from Bristol to repopulate Dublin. The event became known as Black Monday and was unsurprisingly remembered in the city's history for decades and centuries to come. It may have been this event that provoked the King, John, to instruct the Archbishop of Dublin, Henry of London, to make and maintain a castle at Castle Kevin to defend from the invasions of the great Wicklow families, the O'Burns and O'Tools. You see, Castle Kevin was, in many ways, the last Norman outpost in the Wicklow Mountains, beyond which lay the valleys populated by the Gaelic Irish. Although the Gaelic Irish were still tenants of the Archbishop, it was from these mountain valleys that that raid in 1209 had most likely come. The king no doubt hoped that a fortress of at Castle Kevin would maintain peace in the region. It was this order, therefore, that led to Castle Kevin taking its medieval shape, a large fortress most likely initially made from earthen embankments with a large town to its east. While the Norman settlers lived in the shade of the castle, there is no evidence that it was initially needed for military purposes. There was no repeat of the attack in 1209. No doubt there was suspicion and resentment, particularly from the disenfranchised Gaelic Irish. But it appears, in its first few decades anyway, Castle Kevin prospered. While it was very isolated and potentially vulnerable, there is no evidence of violence between the Anglo-Normans and the neighbouring Gaelic Irish. Indeed, the Gaelic Irish continued to pay their rents due to the Norman Archbishop of Dublin, like they had to the Gaelic bishops of Glendalough before him. In this environment, the settlement went from strength to strength, and by 1225, Castle Kevin was granted royal permission to hold a weekly market, which no doubt attracted many of the Gaelic Irish from the surrounding region, as they could come and sell produce and also get goods from further afield. By 1228, there was even Gaelic Irish people living as free tenants among the settlers. One such person was a certain McLaughlin O'Toole, who was fined for poaching. In the following decades, there's very little historical mentions of Castle Kevin. But as the saying goes, no news was good news, and this was particularly relevant to medieval Castle Kevin, given what was coming next. The 1209 massacre at Cullenswood, outside Dublin, was evidence that the Gaelic Irish in the mountains were not opposing the Anglo-Norman settlement in the region on a continual basis, were still disgruntled by the colonists' presence. This feeling, while it was invisible through action for decades, never subsided. Then, after several winters of bad weather in the early 1270s, a dam of resentment finally broke and an open revolt exploded across the Wicklow Mountains among the Gaelic Irish in the region. Now the details of this revolt are covered in a show I did about four episodes ago. It's called the Great Wicklow Revolt of the 1270s. So I'm not going to go into detail on the causes or wider effects of the revolt in this podcast. It suffices to say that the peace in the Wicklow Mountains was shattered in the early 1270s. In this show, we're going to zone in on what happened at Castle Kevin, where the world of the settlers was effectively turned upside down. The peaceful coexistence was shattered, and this isolated mountain fortress now became a violent nightmare for those living there. Life became increasingly difficult as nighttime raids saw houses burned, animals stolen, and anyone who stood in the way of the Gaelic Irish raiders was killed. As the situation deteriorated, the garrison of the fortress captured five hostages who had been taken from the surrounding O'Toole, O'Burn and Harold families in an effort to bind the wider families to peace. While this must have provoked great interest in Castle Kevin and hope among the population that this might end the raids, it was completely ineffectual. Indeed, by 1272, the hostages had to be taken from Castle Kevin to the nearby fortress of Newcastle McKinnigan several miles to its east 
as Castle Kevin was no longer safe. Finally, in 1274, serious military aid arrived in the region in the form of an army led by the Knights Hospitaller. Castle Kevin at this stage was increasingly a no-go area and even this large army would not even dare base themselves at the beleaguered settlement. Instead, they chose Newcastle, further to the east. Nonetheless, the arrival of this major force must have given people in Castle Kevin hope that salvation had arrived at last. However, when the Hospitallers led their army against the Gaelic Irish a few miles south of Castle Kevin at Glenmalure, they were seriously defeated and even the Grand Master of the Religious Order was taken prisoner. When word of this defeat arrived at Castle Kevin, no doubt in the shape of stragglers coming from the battle, nothing short of cold fear must have gripped the population. They were now going to bear the brunt of this defeat. The Gaelic Irish would unquestionably be spurred on. In the following years, it appears the lands surrounding Castle Kevin were utterly devastated. In the six years between 1271 and 1277, rents amounted to a miserable £8. It's highly likely at this stage that many of the plots of land were abandoned by the tenants given the rents were normally averaging at about £50 a year. Who could blame them though? They were practically defenceless on what was increasingly the front line between the Norman colony and the Gaelic Irish who were desperate in these times of famine. While it increasingly looked like the Norman presence around Castle Kevin was on the verge of collapse, in 1277 a major military operation was being prepared in Dublin which would give respite to the beleaguered settlement. Facing complete destruction, Castle Kevin was finally relieved in 1277 when an army under Robert de Ufford marched into the Wicklow Mountains and quartered themselves at Castle Kevin. The long military train arriving out of the mountains must have been a sight for sore eyes for those who had not fled and lived through the terror. Dufford not only brought a large host of crossbowmen but also brought bread, beer, wheat, oats, cows, hogs and other victuals including iron, salt, nails, boards, canvas and ropes to fortify and construct Castle Kevin anew. If Dufford was bringing these materials it appears that Castle Kevin must have been all but destroyed in the various raids and warfare of the previous years. Before he rebuilt Castle Kevin Dufford routed the Gaelic Irish in Glenmalure and then set about transforming the beleaguered settlement. The earthen mound that supported the fortification was converted into a square platform and was now defended by stone embankments and towers and a large gatehouse. This renovation had the desired effects and the revolt died down in the following years. In 1277 and 1278 Castle Kevin enjoyed bumper years and the tenants seemed to have come back to the lands as £59 were raised in rent each year. However, it was beginning to become clear though that the revolt in the early 1270s had changed forever the dynamic in the mountains and it would be hard for peace to ever be established permanently again. Indeed, by early 1279, scarcely two years after Dufford had been in the region, Castle Kevin was again destroyed and no tenants could be found that were willing to live in the region. Nevertheless, eventually peace did return, momentarily at least. By 1282, the leaders of the revolt, two McMurrah brothers, had been brutally assassinated and Ireland in general enjoyed a period of peace, so much so that in 1287 a colonial official could describe the country as so pacified these days that in no part is there anyone at war or wishing to go to war. For the people of Castle Kevin, this temporary peace was all well and good, but they can only have known that they now lived on a frontier. And if there was anyone wishing to go to war in Ireland, it was in all likelihood going to be their Gaelic neighbours. In the early 1290s, the peace held and Norman Ireland was enjoying its greatest ever years. The exchequer in Dublin took in £9,000, while 51,000 cattle hides and 1.2 million sheep fleeces were exported in 1290 alone. Castle Kevin 
in its own way was contributing to this success. But disaster was only around the corner. In 1294, the weather began to change in Ireland again and the harvest was poor, bringing with it a famine, the very event that had triggered the revolt around Castle Kevin in the 1270s. With food scarce, and particularly scarce in the mountains among the Gaelic Irish, it would not take much to tip the region into open violence. For those living on the lands around Castle Kevin, tensions must have increased as the winter nights drew in around them. They did not just have to worry whether they would find food in the new year when supplies ran out. Their minds were surely focused on whether they would even survive till then. In the nearby mountains, the Gaelic Irish, desperate for food, may be faced with little choice other than to raid before then. In December 1294, the incident that tipped not only Wicklow, but much of Ireland into war, came when the Lord of Offaly, John Fitzthomas, kidnapped the Earl of Ulster, Richard de Burgh, continuing an age-old dispute between the two most powerful families in Anglo-Norman Ireland. In the aftermath, unsurprisingly, all hell broke loose as a near civil war broke out between these two powerful Norman factions. In Wicklow, the starving Gaelic Irish now had little to fear from the divided colonists and predictably raids began. Newcastle, northeast of Castle Kevin, was listed among the settlements that were burned with other towns, but it appears Castle Kevin may have escaped this time. But the fear that can only have gripped the settlers must have produced many sleepless nights. The slightest noise would have made them jumpy. By late spring 1295, the Norman lords put aside their differences to fight the Gaelic revolt in Wicklow, and they mobilised an enormous army on this occasion. The Earl of Ulster and Lord of Connacht, Richard de Burgh, brought an army from Connacht. He was joined by forces led by the Lord of Offaly, John Fitzthomas, and also Theobald Walter and Thomas Fitzmaurice. For the population of Castle Kevin, they must have breathed a sigh of relief on the 24th of July, 1295, when three Gaelic hostages, one from each of the major families, the O'Tools, the O'Burns and the McMurras, were brought to Castle Kevin as part of a treaty that ended that year's revolt. While this brought peace though, it was clear that life at Castle Kevin was changing permanently and for the worse. The mountains would never return to the peace they had once known. The Normans no doubt looked at their Gaelic neighbours and saw people who had burned their farms, killed their friends and family and devastated their lives in general. Likewise, the Gaelic Irish could look at the Norman colonists who had taken their ancestral lands and forced them into mountain valleys and passes that simply couldn't support life when the weather turned bad. These resentments on both sides created mutual tensions in the mountains and it was clear even the major military campaign of 1295 couldn't end this dispute. Indeed, there was little evidence few in the region believed that the peace forged at Castle Kevin in 1295 would last. In the following two years, rents completely collapsed at Castle Kevin to three pounds, indicating people were getting out of Dodge. It seems clear attracting tenants all across eastern Wicklow was now becoming increasingly difficult. At Newcastle, the lands were described as untilled and nobody would take them. For those who did generate the three pounds of rent at Castle Kevin, life must have been unbearable, with the constant threat of violence hanging over them. For these people who took the risk of staying on and not fleeing, it simply wasn't worth it, as life was not about to improve either. While much of Ireland did enjoy relative peace in the following decade, the Norman settlements in East Wicklow were constantly attacked. Several towns were burned and the Gaelic Irish were slowly but surely beginning to make life completely unworkable. In 1302, the just this year himself, the most powerful representative of the king in Ireland, would not even risk holding court in Newcastle, which was far safer than Castle Kevin. By 1307, Castle Kevin now was a completely militarised settlement. It could only be held 
by a large garrison which that year was strengthened by 30 horsemen and 80 footmen. They brought with them thousands of crossbow bolts, large supplies of wheat and oats, presumably under fear that the settlement would face siege. It's questionable by this stage how much, if any, non-military daily life existed in the settlement. As living on land in or near Castle Kevin for any extended period of time meant almost certain death. If you lived in a farmstead nearby, the garrison in the castle, even if they were only a few hundred metres away, would be no use if the Gaelic Irish swept down in a nighttime raid. Due to its isolation, even the garrison itself couldn't stop the fortress and settlement eventually succumbing to one of the inevitable attacks and in 1308 the settlement beside the fortress was burned yet again. Although one of those allegedly responsible was captured, taken to Dublin, drawn behind the tails of horses and then hanged in a brutal public execution, this did little to stem the tide. Major military missions couldn't help either, as late in the year the arrival in the mountains by one of the most famous military leaders of the era, William Leah de Burgh, cousin of the Earl of Ulster and deputy just this year, did nothing to restore order. Life was increasingly intolerable. The Gaelic Irish, so long marginalised, could now smell victory and began to press home their advantage. Castle Kevin, beleaguered, isolated and increasingly undefendable, was attacked again in 1309 and this time the castle itself was destroyed. We can only guess the fate of the garrison. That year of 1309, the famed English noble, Piers de Gaveston, and the supposed lover of King Edward II, became the latest figure to try and stabilise the collapsing frontier in Wicklow. He led a large force to Castle Kevin, rebuilt the castle at a cost of £800, and in an indication of just how bad the situation had become, Gaveston had to cut a path through to Glendalough, scarcely four miles away. This served to highlight the gravity of the situation facing the Normans in East Wicklow. If they couldn't even manage to maintain a route to Glendalough, it was surely only a matter of time before the Gaelic Irish drove them entirely from the region. The year 1315 presented a perfect opportunity for the Gaelic Irish to decisively defeat the Normans as that year Anglo-Norman Ireland faced a new threat in the shape of a massive invasion from Scotland which landed into Ulster. It was led by the King of Scotland Robert the Bruce's brother and was an extension of a decade old war between the Kings of England and Scotland. The Gaelic Irish in the Wicklow Mountains really had little interest in this war and lent little direct support to the Scots but instead used the opportunity to attack the now distracted Normans. Soon Anglo-Norman life in Wicklow was hanging by a thread. In 1316, Hugh Lawless, a Norman leader in the region, outlined just how desperate the situation had become when he wrote to the just this year Edmund Butler. He described how, by the malice and wantonness of the Irish in the mountains of Leinster, the settlers had been expelled and removed from their fortresses and manors and houses up and to the present, and many of the said faithful subjects of the king had been slain by Irish felons. Lawless went on to describe how the Normans were now living in a confined and narrow part of the country, namely between Newcastle and Wicklow, where they had the sea between Wales and Ireland for a wall on one side, and the mountains of Leinster and diverse other wooded and desert places on the other. Although the Normans would eventually emerge victorious over the invading Scots in 1318, they were seriously weakened now, and the prospect of successfully defending their territories against the resurgent Gaelic Irish was no longer possible. By 1320, it appears that the overland route between Dublin and places like Castle Kevin had been cut by the Gaelic Irish in North Wicklow. That year, the just this year, Edmund Butler had to be provisioned by sea when he fought in East Wicklow. In 1326, the first major territorial loss was recognised when an evaluation was made of the Archbishop of Dublin's estate and Glendalough wasn't even mentioned. This indicated 
that not only was Glendalough in Gaelic Irish hands, but now the Normans saw no hope of reconquering it, so didn't even bother to mention it. Alone, isolated, and surrounded by ever more powerful Gaelic Irish enemies, Norman life at Castle Kevin was clearly on borrowed time. In 1337, the settlement and castle was stated to be in a state of disrepair, and the Archbishop of Dublin was ordered to rebuild the site, but no reworkings at this stage was going to save it. In 1343, Castle Kevin was attacked, destroyed, but yet again it was rebuilt. Ominously, this was the last mention of Castle Kevin under Norman control. How exactly it finally fell is not recorded, perhaps indicative that none of the final garrison survived to tell the tale. Soon afterwards, the entire region passed to the Gaelic Irish, who, after waging over seven decades of rage and warfare, through tenacity and persistence, had finally emerged victorious. Today, the site of Castle Kevin is just a mound of earth, which still guards the surrounding territory, but its desolate, lonely state hides its fascinating history. In the next episode, we will return to the story of the 11th century in Ireland, as it has been a while since we've looked at it. Before I go, don't forget, if you want to book your place on a tour of Dublin this summer, just contact me at history at irishhistorypodcast.ie. That's history at irishhistorypodcast.ie. Until next time, Slán. Yeah.